So I want to do a quick follow-up video on allulose because it's a very interesting topic and I had a lot of interesting questions about it. Um, allulose hasn't been around that long, you know, about two years or so. It's in many products now. I think it's a very interesting product. I certainly am buying some products that has it in it, but I think we should still be cautious to consume this too much and too regular. And I want to explain a couple of these things um, about how it's made because that's very interesting. One question that came up is, well, it's mostly made from fructose, from corn, and corn is GMO. Would this be an issue for the allulose? I think it's an excellent question. In nature, allulose does occur in very, very small amounts in um, things like uh, raisins, jackfruit, and figs. But these are tiny amounts, so we you know, don't really consume enough there that we could really have kind of an idea of how it behaves in our body. Now, uh, commercially, it's made from corn, and that's the easiest. It's made from fructose, and the reason is when you look at the molecules, this is fructose and this is allulose. And the only change, and these are very small molecules, these are monosaturides, so single sugars. When you see the changes only here, this OH group is flipped from here to here. So that's a very small change. Now, whether that's made chemically or if it occurs in nature like this, I mean, I would argue it's the same molecule, you know. So that I don't think is the issue. I mean, allulose is allulose. If they did it um, commercially like this, you know, enzymatically and something else would come up, then it's not allulose anymore. So to be allulose, it has to look exactly like that. So what they do is they take the um, fructose from the corn. And yes, most corn, about 90% in the US of, uh, of our corn is GMO corn. Now, that means that it's genetically engineered to withstand um, you know, chemicals like, like, like Roundup, for example, so that you know the crops get sprayed and only the weeds get killed but the crop doesn't get affected so there, there there's definitely a chemical engineering that takes place there and i'm not a big fan of gmo i don't think it's, it's something it's, it's a bit murky still to me however again when we look at the changes in the gmo that's mostly involving proteins in the plant here we're looking at fructose the fructose is not gmo changed to begin with i mean otherwise again it wouldn't be fructose anymore right so again we're just using this because it's a cheap way to get a bunch of fructose so that then they can run an enzymatic reaction. So they're using actually uh, engineered microbes that convert fructose to allulose. There are other ways to do it, and I looked this up, so you can do it with heat and, and pressure and um, catalysts, I mean really chemically. However, then you can produce a lot of toxins in, in these reactions. Making it enzymatically like this is a very safe way, I believe. Uh, and again, the key in the end is how does it get filtered out? What else is in that batch that they make? And I think an argument can be made, again, when we think of most of the corn comes from GMO. So a good point that I would say, a point of concern would be, well, if there is, or, or certainly will be pesticides in the corn itself, now you're using that batch to uh, take the fructose, take it out and enzymatically convert it into allulose, right? And then you filter that out. In the filtering process, do you really only filter out the final product, the allulose, or are there any of these contaminants, you know, these pesticides that were on the corn, do they get transferred with that? And that is something that, again, I don't know, um, you could test the batch. I'm sure they do these things, you know, there are certain ways to test what is really in there for purity. And I'm just assuming right now that that's been done, but, you know, I'll look more into it. You know, I don't know how stringent those regulations are. So again, there might be some allulose that says, hey, this is uh, something, you know, it's organic. And then, you know, it would have to come ideally from a crop that wasn't GMO. But I don't know about the, um, you know, they're very clever about wording on these things. You know what I mean? If, if in the end, well, we just said fructose and we converted it, you know, enzymatically, is it, is, it now, is it now organic? I don't know how clear those labels are. All right. So... It, fructose, sorry, allulose is about 70% as sweet as sucrose. Sucrose is table sugar. So sucrose basically is a disaturide. So you have basically glucose and fructose together. And that's kind of a good standard to know. We all know table sugar and it's about 70% as sweet. And that's great because when you look at things like stevia, stevia is from what I've read about 200 times as sweet as sucrose. So when you're using it for practical purposes, for baking and stuff like that, that's kind of harder to dose. I mean, that's a lot sweeter and has a certain, you know, of its own aftertaste, which some people don't like. Um, how is it absorbed? So basically 30% gets excreted in the feces right away, it goes straight through. 70% is absorbed in the small intestine, so it goes in. However, it's not metabolized. So this is one of those molecules, it goes in, you know, in this form, and it 
comes out in this form in the urine. So it's not really used for anything. So it's an interesting thing. So, so therefore allulose has a very, very low caloric value. When you look at it, it is about 0.4 calories per gram. Compare that to sucrose, which is four calories per gram. Now, so, so this is 10 times less, but even there, I would say, since it's not really used up in any shape, we don't metabolize it. It doesn't enter the citric acid cycle. It doesn't get used for energy. You really can say in the end that, you know, it's really zero. I mean, we don't really, um, you know, have any, any caloric value that we extract from this. That's how I would argue. So, I mean, that's fine. I think that's, that's great. And it's interesting that we have this kind of sugar substitute that is almost as sweet as sugar, behaves similarly. It'll brown like sugar when you bake with it, for example, and all these things. But again, it does not have the caloric value. Pretty much caloric value is pretty much zero. So most of the studies, interestingly, that I found were done in, in, in rodents. There are some studies in humans, that's more safety study about dosing and all these things. But in rodents, the study is something that was very interesting. You can't always compare, of course, but it gives you an idea, you know. I mean, of course, you know, we are different types of mammals, but, you know, there are certain overlaps. So when you look at what they found, it was actually very profound. Decreases gastrointestinal inflammation, decreases fat, decreases adipose tissue, decreases a hemoglobin A1C, reverses insulin resistance. So it's really something that you can treat diabetes with technically. This is all in, all in rodents. And it is supposed to be therapeutic in atherosclerosis. And that's an interesting one as well. So it can really help with atherosclerosis. Again, rodent studies, and um, we have to take that with a grain of salt. We need a lot more data in human trials, of course. They did some basic safety trials. Well, how much can we give before we get issues? And so they said, well, about 54 grams. At 54 grams, when they gave these two uh, study subjects, they started to get some GI upset, you know, like bloating, gas, diarrhea, and whatnot. Nothing major, I mean, but it's, it, it, it was, uh, you know, basically probably adding as an, as an osmotic laxative at that point. So it seems to be pretty safe. It's not metabolized, it's excreted. Now, just because it's not metabolized doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. We know a lot of um, elements that we give as treatment. For example, lithium is used in, in, in mood disorders and lithium certainly can become toxic to the kidney in higher amounts. And that's also something that doesn't get metabolized since it's an, it's an element. This, of course, is much bigger than an element. These are basically, um, it's a small molecule, but it doesn't get metabolized. There may be a point where that becomes toxic and that's really hard to know because we don't have, understand it very well yet. So. The FDA has approved it uh, for consumption, but kind of still on the label counts it as a carbohydrate. You know, usually when you look at net carbs, they say, oh, you can just subtract that. They're not at that stage yet. So they just, you know, count it in there usually, you know, that's at least the latest that I've read. So it is um, counted, you know, it's used. I think it is very promising because we can use it in many products. It is um, closely in sweetness to what sugar is. And it does have, at least in rodents, I mean, in the studies in rodents, amazing benefits. Now, should we just go crazy on it and consume it? I think we should be cautious with it. I think we should, you know, I don't mind buying a product where this is uh, part of how it's sweetened. You know, I bought this cereal that I sometimes give to my kids as well called Magic Spoon. And they use allulose in there together with monk fruit and stevia. It's not the only sweetener in there. They combine the sweeteners a bit. And that might also be that they have to do that, but also it might still be that allulose is a bit more expensive. So part of, we always got to think of when they manufacture stuff, they want something that's also sort of reasonable. But if you think about, you could add it technically, and this is an interesting thing. So one thing that's been shown is if you add it, let's say to fruit or you add it to any carbohydrate rich meal, it will decrease the amount of carbohydrates getting into our system, into your body. And the way it does that, it's competitively, if you think about this, com you know, uh, occupying the receptors where the uh, sugars can come in. So since allulose is there, then let's say uh, glucose or fructose can't get in. So it makes a huge difference. It can, can decrease the carbohydrate absorption by up to 70% of something we're eating. And that's actually a huge number. And it's a bit dangerous, I think, because we can just, you know, go to, you know, hey, we want to eat low carb. I like a, a carb-rich meal. I'm just going to put a bunch of allulose in there and I'm going to decrease significantly what I take in in the end. But is that safe? Is that a good thing to do? Is that risky? Don't know. One thing that has been found uh, with allulose is that is actually supportive to the bacteria in the gut. And that's actually a very good thing. So again, it's the question is always how much is good? At what point does it become bad? And when you... Um, Think about it, supporting the gut bacteria, yes, that's true. But again, 
allulose may also be used by certain gut bacteria that we don't want to benefit from this. Because gut bacteria live a lot on uh, uh, fibers that we're eating and they also to some extent can live on allulose, not all of them. And if we give a large amount of this, so we might pr be preferentially feeding a certain type of bacteria that we don't necessarily want to feed. There are some papers that discuss this a bit, so there's still some concerns about that. But I would say, look, in small amounts, I mean, certainly in very small amounts, we've been exposed to this for a long time because it naturally occurs, uh, like I said, you know, in figs, raisins, and, and jackfruit, and some others. In the larger amounts, I'd still be cautious. I mean, again, in small amounts, let's say, you know, less than uh, five to 10 grams a day maximum. Um, I think this should be okay at the moment. And I'm, I'm sure we're gonna see more studies on this because there's such interest in the industry to use this commercially. And if we can really find in humans that as in rats, it decreases you know, risks of diabetes, it can reverse maybe insulin resistance, it can be used you know, to sweeten some things, to just you know, broaden what we can eat that is low carb or healthier, that cuts out the fructose, that gets converted easily to fat. If we, can, if we can help with that, that would be great. I do think we need a few more studies on that. So I wouldn't go buy bags and bags of this and put it on all our food. But in small amounts, my opinion at this point is it's, it's quite safe and I'm gonna continue to use it in small amounts in, in certain products.